Calimera, welcome to Stupid Ancient History, Stupid A-Level Greeks. The sun's shining, I'm wearing a toga, my Kylix is full on a meeting olives, and today we're going to look particularly at the Battle of Mantinea in 418 BC. So before we start looking at the actual Battle of Mantinea, we need to look at some background to it. It's not just that the Greeks suddenly decide by 418 they're so fed up of everything they're just going to have a scrap. The Battle of Mantinea is the first real re return to hostilities following the Peace of Nicias or Nicaeus. Um, it's the opening gambit of the Second Second Peloponnesian War, and this comes about because of this. There's a deterioration in relationships directly resulting from that peace. A lot of the Peloponnesian allies are really not very happy with this clause in the peace that allows Sparta and Athens to change the terms of the peace treaty by mutual consent, most importantly without consulting their allies. This is less of a problem for the Athenians who've decided they've got an empire, they've scrapped the dealing league, but the Spartans are still working on the pretense that they are a league, a bicameral league absolutely, but their allies are still important to them. This becomes really problematic for some of the allies who do not like the fact that Sparta, this previously flaccid leader or hegemon of the league, are calling shots without their say so. More importantly, and for the first time ever, Argos decide to do something. Argos now feel that by 418 they can challenge Sparta for domination of the Peloponnese. They feel that Sparta have proven themselves through things like Pylos and Sphacteria, through their poor handling of the Athenians and the previous wars, the Argives now think they can challenge Sparta for dominance. So they start moving against Sparta. With this, two particular allies, Elis and Mantinea, join the Argos. They're unhappy with the treaty. They don't necessarily see a future ally to Sparta. And, you know, Argos haven't done anything. They're a bit of an unknown, so why not? Why not join them? Other Peloponnesians, though, particularly people like Corinth and Megara, don't join Argos because they distrust their democratic government. Argos, at this point, is a democracy. The Peloponnesian League is ultimately dominated by oligarchies because this is the method of government the Spartans prefer. And they do not trust Argos. Why would they? They've done nothing. The big problem, though, that faces Sparta and Corinth is any alliance between Elis, Mantinea and Argos will effectively chop the Peloponnese in half. It will form a barrier between Sparta, Laconia and the Peloponnesians in the south and the more northern allies like Corinth and Megara and Epidaurus. This is a real problem, especially if you're Corinth who will now feel isolated and cut off from any real support. And with Athens potentially being still a threat, you do not want to be separated from your allies. This is a massive, massive problem. This isn't the only reason we get to war though. The final straw that pushes everyone into conflict and completely tears up the previous peace treaty is that Sparta now form a new alliance with particularly Thebes and the Boeotians. This really, really gets to Athens. Athens are really unhappy. They effectively feel themselves now hemmed in. They've got a long standing history with Thebes. They do not get on at all. One of the previous stumbling blocks had been Sparta's alliance with Thebes. Athens did not want this. With a re-engagement of this alliance, uh, the Athenians are particularly, particularly unhappy. The Spartans do the best to tell, to warn the Athenians that this is not a hostile move, it's simply a mutually beneficial agreement. And they send allies and they send emissaries to Athens to speak in front of the Athenian leadership. And they're trying the best to persuade Athenians that this a war need not happen, but ultimately they are they are manipulated by the the current people's favourite in Athens, a guy called Alcibiades, a guy you will get to know pretty soon. Alcibiades is the new people's champion following the death of Cleon. He's an aristocrat. He's a smooth talker. He's certainly self-centered, and he sees probably personal benefit in the same way that Cleon did when he 
it re-engaged hostilities with Sparta. He sees personal benefit in actually starting a conflict with Sparta. He get he tricks the Spartan emissaries into not revealing their true strength to the Athenians. The Athenians think fighting Sparta will not be a problem, and ultimately we get the restarting of hostilities between Athens, their allies, their empire, and the Peloponnesians. But not all Peloponnesians. So the first conflict here is this, as before, realigning members of the Peloponnesian League back to Sparta, particularly Elis and Mantinea. So with the return to hostilities, the eye of the storm ultimately is now Mantinea. This is where the Spartans see the seat of the rebellion being. And adds to that end, the majority of soldiers facing the Spartans are Mantineans. They are joined by other people from the region, rebel Arcadians. Even though Argos ultimately are the instigators in all this by creating this new alliance, they only send a smaller force. Thucydides does point out, however, they send 1,000 elite hoplites. Uh, he makes quite clear mention of those because they're meant to be Argos's best. They are aristocratic, they are well respected, they are well regarded. The Athenians as well, not wanting to miss out on a good scrap or any easy opportunity as they see it at this point to weaken Sparta and to help break up the Peloponnesian League, they send hoplites as well. Roughly about a thousand. It's not a significant force, it's symbolic if nothing else. It's unusual however because Athens, as we know, have not really engaged in hoplite warfare since the First Peloponnesian War in any significant instance. Facing these, the Spartan forces are mostly made up of hoplites. The Spartans are again returning to their previous form, what they're known for, heavy Greek infantry. They're meant to be the best, they've got a lot to prove to themselves after Pylos, so they make up the bulk of the army. It's not just hoplites, though. this is not Thermopylae Mark II. They're also joined by Brasidians, who are veterans of the Thracian campaign, and Scyrita, who are lighter infantry. It's not just Spartans, they are joined by other loyal Arcadians and other Peloponnesians, and there is some Spartan cavalry. So roughly, all in all, the Spartan force is about 9,000 troops. So the two sides are roughly equally matched. The Spartans, interestingly this time, are led by a king, King Aegis II. Even though he's leading, he's sent though with a lot of, the, with these ten advisors. Previously he'd been a bit of a naughty boy, he'd done some bad things, he'd made some silly mistakes. So it seems almost like he's got to go to battle and not, they don't trust him completely with their army. They send ten guys to check his homework, make sure he's doing things right. So we have these two forces approaching Mantinea, ready to lock horns. And what unfolds really is considered one of the most quintessential hoplite battles of the Peloponnesian Wars, if not history. It is just about as textbook a conflict as you will get. So onto the battle itself. The details of the battle are recorded in Thucydides, book 5.63 to 7.4. It's very Thucydidean, it's very specific, it's very detailed, it's very logical. So, what we see is this is not just a straightforward fight from the beginning. The Spartans have to really work to prize the Mantineans out of their defences. No one in their right mind wants to go onto a field and lock horns with 9,000 angry gym lads with spears. The Spartan Mirage, the Pufferfish may have taken a bit of a beating after Pylos, but the sight of 9,000 big angry Spartans on a battlefield is likely to scare the pants off most people. So the Spartans have to work to lure the Mantineans out. Eventually, after a couple of attempts, this happens, and the two sides prepare for battle. We're told the Spartans advance onto the battlefield to the sound of flutes. This is again very typical of what we understand about hoplite warfare. The flutes are used not just to keep time and march in order, but can be used to signal and command. So again, we're pointing out that these Spartans on the battlefield, they are professionals. They are what we expect from Spartans. They know what they're doing. As the two sides advance to each other, Thucydides makes a real point about the fact that both sides move to their right. 
This is not unusual apparently in hoplite warfare and it's largely to do with how the shield wall works. As the men are walking forward, remember the shield covers your, your shield covers your left side and the right hand side of the person next to you. Thucydides explains this that there is a natural move to the right as each man tries to stay behind the shield of the person on his right so effectively you get some drifting. This is not uncommon. The problem Sparta have though is that on their left flank the sh their forces don't stretch out quite as far as the others. They don't stretch out quite as far as the Mantineans. The Mantinean force stretches wider than the Spartans. Now Aegis spots this and with this move to the right the first thing he does is he commands his, those on his left wing, the Helots, the Skiritai, the Presidians, to move further to the left. He's desperately worried that the Mantineans will surround and get round that left flank and effectively engulf them. The problem with this instruction though is that that will leave a massive gap in the middle, in the middle of his line. If the left wing goes further left and the right wing is dragging to the right, there's going to be a gap. This is a real problem because this would allow the Mantineans just to push through um, and engulf the Spartans. It's almost like the pincer movement from Marathon but without anything in the middle. There's no Miltiades in the middle. So the commanders of these regiments, these guys know what they're doing, whereas the suggestion is Aegis doesn't. The commanders of these regiments refuse, which is unusual. You don't refuse your king, but apparently you do. They know that moving further left will create this gap. So they send messages back to Aegis saying, no, we're not doing it, but it's too late. As the hoplites on the right have drifted further to further and further to the right, the left has been exposed and the Spartan force effectively is split and the Mantineans push through. This is a big, big crisis. The Mantineans and their allies push really hard at the left. They see this gap and they go for the left because this is obviously the easier target. You've got light infantry, Brazidians, not all Spartan hoplites. They're the easy target and they push the left flank right back to the baggage. So this is potentially a crisis. If the Mantineans on the right, the, those facing the Spartans on the right, have the same success, this is all over for Sparta. Luckily though, the Spartan hoplites on the right, these professional, well-trained, full-time soldiers, are having none of it they are able to quite quickly overwhelm and rout the Athenians and the Argives, who've done the majority of the fighting on that side. Again, the Spartan professionalism, the skill in battle, the thing they've been bred to do really pays off, and they, are quick, they quickly overwhelm these two forces. Allowing them to run, the Spartans then wheel round, turn on, the remaining enemies, the Mantineans and Arcadians, and the elite Argive hoplites. They surround them, they box them in, but interestingly, um, again another person who's stepping up to the plate instead of Aegis, a general called Pharax, tells Aegis to leave gaps for particularly these Argive hoplites to escape. It's a bit daft. You, there's lots of reasons. You could say that the Spart there's no glory to the Spartans in chasing a defeated enemy. But maybe Pharax has been a bit more clever because these 1,000 hoplites are aristocrats. They are from the oligarchy. They are the nobility. They are the oligarchs or the sons of oligarchs. And if they are allowed to leave the battlefield alive with all their bits and bobs in pieces, possibly they could then form an alliance block that Sparta could use to win over Argos. Without telling too long a story, ultimately the Mantineans and the Argives are defeated. Over a thousand Mantineans and allies are killed and only 300 Spartans are killed. Again, mm, really? A bit Thermopylae, but we've got to take the numbers as they are. So then our next question ultimately has to be, why is the Battle of Mantinea 
that important? Why is it significant, apart from obviously being the first engagement of the Second Second Peloponnesian War? The first reason it's important is that it manages to bring the Peloponnese back under Spartan control. Ellis and Mantinea rejoin the Peloponnesian League in the same way that Megara did in the First Peloponnesian War. They come back, cap in hand, promising never to do it again. If anything, Spartan has a stronger hold on the Peloponnese and its allies and can now turn its attention to the pesky matter of Athens who are still kicking off and being problems and hopefully, dear God, they just want to end this century of conflict because it's getting tedious. It also pushes the Peloponnese even further under Spartan control and this idea of Pharax is to let these elite hoplites escape seems to have worked. Within months of the battle, certainly by the end of the year, the democratic government of Argos is overthrown. The people in Argos blame their government for this, what they see is quite foolhardy move. Um, they've not suffered massive casualties, but they've suffered significant losses and shame. So the oligarchs overthrow the democratic government of Argos. They kick them out. And as soon as this has happened, once again, they sign another 50-year peace with Sparta. So Argos is back to sitting there doing nothing. Does it mean they're friends? No. Does it mean they're going to kick off? Probably not. It does mean Sparta can now focus all its attentions on finally sorting out Athens. Speaking of Athens, this is also why the Battle of Mantinea is quite significant. The Athenians quickly remembered why they didn't fight the Spartans on land. You know, it's been a while. I mean, they've not had a spanking on a battlefield by the Spartans since the Battle of Tanagra in the First Peloponnesian War. And again, 20, 30, 40 years later, they've realised we do not fight the Spartans on land. Let's get back to the boats. Fighting Sparta on land is not going to work. The flip side of that, especially in Sparta, is Sparta re-establishes themselves as the great warriors, the great hoplites they are meant to be. The Spartan Mirage is back. The puffer fish is back to being spiky. They level all the criticisms from Pylos's factory completely. The, the idea that Spartans are these great warriors has once again been proved with this quite resounding victory at Mantinea against, all right, an arguably smaller force, but a significant force nonetheless. And the Spartan individual skill and ability on the battlefield, particularly <coughs> this wheeling round halfway through conflict to engage with the left, uh, impresses Greeks across the Greek world. It reminds them that actually, yeah, the Spartans are pretty good at war, and they should be. The other thing that's interesting is we see the return of kings leading armies on the battlefield. Uh, in Xenophon's Polity of the Spartans, in Book 13, he makes very clear that it is the sacred duty of the king, and only the king, to lead an army in battle. Now, obviously, throughout the Archidamian War, we've seen some variations on this. We've seen people like Brasidas leading his, hop, his Helot army in Thrace, partly because of a crisis in kingship. And you can argue that the Spartans haven't really had a strong war king since Leonidas. You can, Pleistonax went to war, Archidamus went to war, but both relatively reticently. Aegis seems to be trying to reinvent the role of the Spartan king to be what it should be. The king leading the army, <coughs> being successful and defeating all that comes in front of him. It's not 100% back to normal, we're not back to pre-Persian war levels of Spartan kingship because don't forget, Aegis had to be sent with strict supervision. They did not trust him to make his own decisions, as we've seen partway through the battle. His rule wasn't absolute, but it's important that it's a Spartan king leading the troops. Again, it's not back to pre-Persian War because the army itself is not made up of just hoplites. We see the return of the Skiritai and the Brasidians from Thrace. And even though they 
certainly didn't compare to the Spartan hoplites in terms of their success and their ability to just trounce everything in their pass, they are still quite significant. They are important. It's important that we see really that the Spartans are now more and more happy with this idea of adapting. These very, very conservative, traditional people who are so invested in their one style of warfare and the idea behind this style of warfare and everything that is the hoplite project, they are adapting. They've had to previously adapt with Brasidas and Thrace after Pylos, but now they're starting to merge the two to something where they are more comfortable. They are in amalgamating these new ways of fighting, these new types of soldiers, in with their traditional hoplites. And this now seems to be working. The final reason why this is significant and what happens next in our narrative is it shifts the scope of the war away from the Peloponnese. If we track the geography of the Peloponnesian Wars, they do bounce between fighting within the Peloponnese and the Isthmus of Corinth to elsewhere. We see this even more so with what happens next. The scope of the war shifts to the very, very far edges of the Greek world as Sparta absolutely secure their hold on the Peloponnese. So there we have it, a quick little run through of the Battle of Mantinea, what happened and why was it important. Thank you for listening, I hope this has been useful, informative and not too tedious. Enjoy reading Thucydides, if you want to leave a comment below please do, but please be nice and until next time, goodbye.